and the behavior doesn't tell us uh, about consciousness. In fact, that movement has faded away over the last couple of decades, partly because the scientists themselves found it almost impossible to exclude attributions of consciousness to animals. I mean, they, they tried, and if you read journals uh, in that period, they would only talk about behavior. So if they were giving a rat an electric shock, uh, they wouldn't say something like, um, the shock caused pain to the rat, which, uh, which uh, was hurt and uh, therefore tried to get away from the pain. That's all uh, attributing mental states. They would say uh, the rat, or more likely they would say the subject S, uh, exhibited aversive behavior, um, meaning that it moved away from the source of the, uh, of the shock. But um, one of the behaviors itself acknowledged in uh, dealing with, uh, with primates, with monkeys, that uh, if you wanted to explain to other people working with monkeys things like, you know, watch out for this one, she has a nasty temper, or this one is really um, gentle and uh, affectionate, and if you uh, do things she likes, she'll, she'll come with you. Um, you know, to, to do that in behaviorist language was almost impossible to actually convey to people what the different monkeys were like. Or you could very simply do it in the most natural language, which attributed mental states and personality traits to the animals. So, as I say, almost nobody really defends that view and scientists working with animals are now quite openly exploring their consciousness and the various kinds of things that they're aware of um, and uh, how that affects the way they behave. So these are reasons why we can be confident that animals, uh, or at least many animals, are conscious. Uh, they have anatomical and physiological similarities with us. They have nervous systems that resemble ours. They behave in appropriate circumstances as we would. So in other words, um, if uh, we get an electric shock, the way we behave is shows important similarities with the way that a, a monkey or a rat will behave if you give them an electric shock. And we share an evolutionary history which uh, means that it, it would be odd if they had evolved similar nervous systems and similar kinds of behavior uh, without there being a similar underlying basis. Not impossible, but uh, the most natural explanation of this, the simplest explanation, is that they evolved the capacity to feel pain because that was a way of alerting them to danger, which might have been life-threatening, and uh, those that developed uh, an ability to sense that danger and to move away from it, to escape it, were more likely to survive and more likely to produce offspring. So there's good reasons why uh, they should have a capacity to pain in uh, similar ways to the way that we have that capacity to pain. But does this apply to all of that vast range of animals that I talked about? Well, um, the similarities that I talked about, the similarities of the uh, anatomy and physiology, uh, the similarities of behavior to some extent, and also the evolutionary distance we have from them varies according to the species or to the larger orders and so on. So if we're talking about mammals and birds, then uh, the similarities are, are close, and uh, those are the categories of beings where I think there's really uh, no room for doubt. I mean, Philosophers can always be skeptical and find a room, room for doubting anything, including the fact that I'm not now dreaming that I'm talking to this audience. <laughs> but, um, but if we're putting aside that kind of skepticism, I don't think there's much room for doubt that animals and birds are conscious. And uh, if you extend that to other vertebrates like fish, uh, maybe there's just a scintilla more room for doubt, but I think there's good grounds for believing that all vertebrates are capable of feeling pain. When you get to invertebrates, uh, there's much more variety of nervous systems. They resemble us, ours less. And it's, it's harder to say um, for sure, you know, how to have the same degree of confidence that there's a capacity to feel pain. But I do think, or, or consciousness generally, I do think that for some of the uh, invertebrates, that still seems overwhelmingly <laughs> Probable. My, my favorite example is the octopus. And if you go on YouTube and search for um, 
octopus and uh, opening a jar, something like that, you get a lovely little video of an octopus which is given a sealed screw top jar, like a peanut butter jar, um, in which there's some tasty morsel that the octopus likes to eat. This octopus has never seen a screw top jar before. It's not something that it evolved to deal with, but it quite rapidly works out how to, uh, what the jar is sort of in a way and, and how to how to open the jar, sort of drapes itself over, over the top of the lid and, uh, and gets the lid off and gets the morsel out. And it's hard to imagine uh, that it could do that if it wasn't conscious and aware of, of the problem that it was trying to solve, because it's a, a novel problem. So I do think that uh, some invertebrates, uh, at least, are conscious. Uh, as far as uh, crustacea, uh, like uh, lobster or crabs or uh, shrimp are concerned, uh, again, it's, it's harder to be really certain. There's a, a more, di more diverse nervous system with different nervous centers. Um, so here I would say it's, there is room for some real doubt, but um, if in doubt and if, it's, if, if our need for uh, doing something that will harm the animal is not uh, great, we might say we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and finally, when you come to the, the bivalves, the, uh, the mollusks like clams and oysters, um, I think the doubt becomes quite considerable. Um, so uh, I think it's actually unlikely that they're capable of feeling pain, partly because the nervous system is so rudimentary, partly because the evolutionary explanation for why pain is useful to us doesn't seem to hold so well for bivalves which basically are immobile they're not really um, able to move away from the source of the pain so um, yeah you know may maybe they don't uh, that seems uh, reasonable but there's still still some doubt and you might want to still say well if there's some doubt um, we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt where there's nothing too much hanging on the other side. But it's mostly in what I'm going to be talking about. I'll be focusing on, on the vertebrates um, as, as the core of what I want to talk about in regard to the effect we have on animals. So what is the ethical view, what are the ethical views that we hold about animals? First, um, it's important to realize where we come from in terms of the Western tradition. Um, because the Western tradition has generally, uh, for most of the last couple of thousand years, uh, denied any real moral status to animals. <coughs> and it's important to think about this because this is the background against which uh, we're forming our views. Aristotle um, is uh, at the, well, not quite at the very beginning, but close to the beginning of, of Western philosophy. And he had a view of the universe in which the less rational exists for the sake of the more rational. So things exist, in other words, for a purpose. The whole universe has a purpose, which is uh, for the, the more rational beings. It so happened, of course, that Aristotle himself uh, was among the more rational beings. So it's a convenient view. Um, not only in that he's human, and uh, uh, the brute beasts, as uh, they're called here, um, are less rational and therefore exist for his sake, to provide him with food and skins and things at that time, and, and the plants less rational still exist for the sake of the animals. But Aristotle even thought that uh, the Greeks were more rational than the barbarians. So um, the same argument provided him with a convenient justification for slavery. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't, we reject that argument, um, but to some extent we still perhaps have in part of our consciousness about animals the idea that, well, because they're less, less rational than, than us, they exist to serve us. Of course, if we accept an evolutionary account of uh, how we came about and how the other animals came about, we know that that's simply not true. They didn't come into existence for a purpose. They came into existence as a result of random mutations and different life forms. Uh, occurred and filled various niches and survived and reproduced and that's how we're here and that's how the other animals exist as well. There's no underlying purpose to it. 
But Aquinas took over uh, a lot of Aristotle.